Amen. Well, let's give it up for our incredible song leaders. Amen. Awesome. You guys sound awesome this morning. Let's get our Bibles open to Luke chapter 18. We've been going through the book of Luke. Amen. Amen. The speakers are fired up. And uh, we, we've approached Luke 18 and Luke chapter 19. And if we recall, in Luke 9, 51, that was the beginning of what is considered the journey section, where Jesus is now traveling up to Jerusalem, ultimately ending in his crucifixion. We're going to be mostly in Luke chapter 19, but I do want to pick it up in Luke chapter 18, because this is just too good of a passage to pass up. Amen? Luke 18, verse 1. It says, and Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. What's a parable? What do you guys think? What is a parable? An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Okay. So this is one of the most direct parables in the Bible. Okay. This one's not confusing. I mean, it shows you what it's going to be about even before he begins the parable. He says, he tells them this parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. So this, this passage is all about praying and never giving up. Amen? Amen? He says, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. There was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? You know, this parable is incredible. It says you should always pray. There is not a situation in your life for which the remedy is not prayer. There is not a challenge in your life that can't be turned into an opportunity if you always pray. The Bible says that you should always pray. Even right now, you can say a little prayer in your heart to make sure that your heart is open to the message. You can see me, and that would be a distraction, amen? Where is this guy from? What kind of crimes has he committed? <laughs> it can be a distraction. You can look at Noah leading songs and think, what's up with his hairdo? <laughs> is his tie tied right? You can, you can get distracted by so many things. Anthony's bald. I'm bald. Angel's bald. Even Jay is bald back there. Amen. I told Jay after Angel and Melissa started dating, I said, bro, you're next. And, and he went and got a haircut. I think he's ready, guys. Amen. You see Kyle Swan and Samantha Swan. You see, what a good-looking couple. It's just, just distracting. You got to, you know, don't focus on what you see. You got to pray to God. Amen. And he says, pray. Now, this woman, she just would not quit. You ever have somebody like that in your life? Yeah. Just don't quit, man. I mean, like, she's persistent. She keeps coming to this judge, and the judge is like, would you leave me alone? Uh -huh. This judge doesn't care about men. He doesn't care about God. He's like, I don't care about you or your cause or what you stand for. I, I couldn't care less, as a matter of fact. But then he says, because she will wear me out with her coming, I'll grant her whatever her wish is. Isn't that wild? This woman was persistent. She was willing to look bad because she had a cause that was just. Wow. She was more concerned about completing that mission and defending that cause than she was about how she was perceived by other people. You know, I'll never forget it. I uh, started dating my wife in 2009. And you can be more fired up about that. And she was awesome. I asked her to be my girlfriend, and she said yes. And, uh, and we dated for a year, and then I, things happened, and I kind of put her on a pedestal, and uh, I was idolatrous of her in my heart, which, which is a, a human problem. That happens all the time. Yeah. People get sentimental, and they get, uh, they get distracted, and they put more hope in people than they do in God, and that's what I had done in, in our relationship, and my wife was courageous enough and brave enough to end the relationship. She said, you know what? I got to break this off. 
So she broke it off. Now, it, she wasn't the only idol in my heart. I had another idol in my heart in New York City, and that was the ministry. I wanted to go full time into the ministry. You know, I wanted to be a leader in God's oh, kingdom. Oh, yeah. And uh, I... And God, it was apparent after a while that I was being opposed by God. I was being humbled by God. That that was not God's plan for my life in that moment. And when I became a disciple of Jesus Christ, when I gave my life to God, after studying the Bible, I believed, I repented, I was made into a disciple, and I got baptized for the forgiveness of my sins. I didn't do that to get into the full-time ministry, amen? I did that because God moved and, and the word was preached and I had faith and I wanted to repent and I got all my sins forgiven when I was baptized. That was an awesome yeah. day. You remember the day you got baptized? Yeah. And Ralph just got baptized last Sunday. I mean, it's, it, it seems like so long ago, but it was just last week. And say, well, I didn't become a disciple for this. So I finally surrendered. I said, you know what? I got to change. I got I to gotta put God back in his proper place. God has to be God. Go. God has to be Lord. God has to be King. So he can be your savior as well. So I finally surrendered and I gave it up. I said, okay, well, I'm, I got to leave New York because this is a bit challenging. I'd been there for three years. So I decided to move to Washington, D.C. My folks were there along with my brother and my sister and her family. So I said, oh, you know, I'll go to D.C. and I'll, I'll continue with my education. I'll, you know, I want to be a disciple. We had a church there in D.C. So I'll go to D.C. The Mejias are there. I'll keep going to school. I'll get a job. I'll start a Bible talk. I want to be fruitful as a disciple. I'll, I'll song lead if they let me. I like leading songs. Amen. I'll, I want to be a disciple, but I got to stop chasing this thing that's not God and prioritizing that thing over my relationship with him. And I remember driving from New York to D.C. It's about a four-hour drive. And I started getting all these calls from the brothers in D.C. Like, hey, bro, so excited you're coming to D.C. I, I got nervous. I thought, well, are one of these guys going to be like my, you know, in the church we have disciplers, we have mentors, we have people that we, we pair up so that we can be strengthened in our faith. I, thought, I said, well, man, I don't know if I'm ready for one of these guys to be kind of over me in the Lord. That's a little scary, you know, like I got to entrust myself to this person. I said, you know what, it doesn't matter who is in my life. They could be deaf, dumb, blind, and mute. As long as they got a Bible and I can confess my sins to them, then that's good enough. Amen. And I surrendered my heart there, and I got to D.C. and got with the evangelist and confessed all my sin for two hours. And then he said, well, here's what I'm thinking. I'll put you in the full-time ministry. I'll disciple you, and it's going to be awesome, and God's going to be you know, glorified. I was like, wait, Amen. did you hear everything I just said? He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. We're good to go. So uh, he said, now here's your job. Your first job. I've got these lollipops that I bought, and I, we're trying to do some fundraising for our special missions contribution. So there was a sister in New York City who had this idea. She'll sell lollipops for $2 a piece. That's an expensive lollipop. But there are these two colored lollipops. They had, like, these different flavors. They were gourmet. It's like caramel apple, uh, banana split, uh, you know, chocolate banana or whatever. You know, it's just so... So, but, but two bucks a piece, I don't know. I'm thinking maybe he's got a, a case or two. Now, in each case, there were eight boxes. And in each box, there were two bags of lollipops. And in each bag of lollipops, there were 32 lollipops. So I'm thinking maybe he's got a few boxes or maybe a case or two. I go to the place where they were stored. There were 10 cases of lollipops, 5,000 lollipops. And he's like, here you go, bro. I'm like, here I go where? Like, where do you want me to go with all this stuff? So I go out, and I, 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 I get lucky the first time I sell a whole bag. I thought, oh, that was great. But you know when you have faith, and, and God just kind of gives you, like, like, a, like a, he gives, like, a miracle to you, you know? And you didn't really pray or work that hard for it, so you're just like, wow, that was easy. I go out next time, I can't sell, I couldn't sell anything. I couldn't sell water in the, in the desert. I mean, I was like, they just would not, they would refuse me. It's like, I'm not buying a lollipop. If people are looking at me like you're 25, able-bodied, and a man, why in the world are you walking around selling lollipops? And that got into my heart. I said, I shouldn't be selling lollipops. This is wrong. I should be a Marine or something. And they're looking at me like, why are you selling lollipops? And I had to get my heart right. I had to say, okay, my heart is bad. I was worried about how I looked, and I forgot why I was doing what I was doing. And then one day I repented. I said, okay, enough. I don't care how I look. So I took four bags of lollipops in a duffel bag, and I went to a rich part of town, and I sold all four bags in four hours. I made $400. Wow. Is that crazy or what? 
And I just, I, I was like, I basically, I don't care if you refuse me. That's okay. I'm not here for me. I'm here for God. And that came across to people. They, were, they could sense that. And this lady didn't care that she was refused by the judge. She cared more about her cause because it was a just cause. You know, as disciples, we're going to get a lot of refusal. You're going to invite a lot of people to church, and most of them will say no. You're going to study the Bible with a lot of people, and most of them won't make it. You'll even baptize lots of people, and many of them will fall away. The Bible says that the love of most will grow cold. But you know what's incredible? In Luke 10, Jesus says that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There are few that are willing to pay the price that this woman paid to see the job done. You know, the harvest is plentiful. It's never going to be the majority of people. There's about 40,000 people that go to school here at USF. What's 1% of 40,000? 400. Can you imagine a campus ministry of 400 sold out disciples for Jesus Christ? I mean, that would just be fired up. Is that the majority? No, it's a small percentage, yet it's very plentiful. The Bible here calls us to pray without ceasing. But not just praying, but praying without giving up, praying without getting discouraged. And he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? What is faith according to the passage, but praying without getting discouraged? Are you with me? I want to call us all back to prayer. You know, what we've proposed to do as disciples is absolutely bonkers. It's crazy. I mean, let me encourage you, amen? What you've signed up for, to evangelize all nations in this generation, is in, it's beyond crazy. It's impossible. You've signed up for an impossible task, and God loves it that way because he expects us to rely on him. And with God, all things are possible. You know, it's incredible. When we go to a big service or we go to our, our church in Miami and, and we're there with all the Southeast churches or we'll go to L.A. for the GLC next August, you know, and, and we're there and we see it. It's like a world evangelism. And you see thousands of disciples. And they got the same conviction you do. And you think, man, this is awesome. And then you come back to Tampa and you're at line in Starbucks and you, you're like, I should share my faith with the barista over there, you know. And, but it's like, I just I don't think I can. <laughs> And you start worrying about how you're perceived rather than protecting the cause that God has given you. Are you with me? So to evangelize the world is a bold mission. Right. We've taken it on 100%. This is what God has given us. This is not from man. This is from God. You say, well, what do we need if, if we're going to do this? We need some help. And we're like soldiers on a battlefield. And you've seen those movies where they're calling in their coordinates. You know, they're getting, they're getting just walloped by the enemy. And they say, dah, 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 and they're calling in the radio. And they're trying to get some air cover and some air support. And without the air support, man, we're toast. We got no chance. And they're calling in their coordinates. And they're typing it in. And they're, they're begging God, <laughs> send us some help. And then come in the angels with the mother load. And they drop it on the enemy and now they can march out with great confidence. That's us as disciples. Prayer is one of the most important things in our lives. We, we, should, we should dread even going out of the front door in the morning without having called in our coordinates to God. You say, God, I need your help. God, I need your strength. God, I, I need courage. God, I need boldness. We got any introverted people in the house? Oh, come on, Chris. I was pretty fired up right there, bro. For an introvert, amen. <laughs> we got any extroverted people in the house? Yeah. Hey, God, God, I, I, you know, the extroverted people need to learn how to actually, like, appeal to the people around them, you know, and realize, like, just because they're fired up doesn't mean everybody else is fired up, amen. Uh, and the introverted people need some of that courage to say, man, I got to give my heart. People love me, and they accept me, amen. And as a fellow introvert, bro, I love you, and I accept you, amen. You see, we need some help from God we got to call in those blue angels and see them soar and hear them thunder. And God is excited and anxious to send us his help. Are you guys with me? On, the title of the lesson, The Time of God's Coming. Go to Luke 19. Right, on, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Those things kind of go together, amen? He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree 
to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He, was, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Point number one, a wondrous gift. You know, Jesus knew Zacchaeus' name. So either he was really popular, or he somehow supernaturally came to that conclusion and knew Zacchaeus' name. And Zacchaeus was a wee little man, amen? Like he was, he was height challenged. Like he was just a short guy. And he wanted to see Jesus, and Jesus coming. He's like, I just want to go see Jesus. Jesus is on his way. So he climbs up a tree because he couldn't see over the people. You know, it's incredible because he calls him by his name. And if your name's in the Bible, it means you did something either really evil and wicked or you did something really special and you became a disciple of Jesus. Yeah. You know, what's incredible here is that the Holy Spirit endowed the apostles to write the New Testament long after this has actually happened. So the fact that he's named and mentioned means that he had not only become a disciple, but stayed faithful. Actually, church history holds that Peter designated him as the bishop of Caesarea, which means he was the lead evangelist, kind of in our modern-day vernacular, of the whole region of Caesarea. Church history also holds that he actually didn't want the job at first, but for God's glory, did what God had called him to do. Amen? He's mentioned, and, and it says here that Jesus calls him. You know, he had some limitations, and don't we all? Yeah. We've got weaknesses. As a matter of fact, you never really start growing. You don't start your true growth until you kind of realize that you're limited, yeah. that you've got some weaknesses, that you've got some thorns in your flesh that will force you to be unorthodox in your approach and rely on God. You know, Jesus calls him and he responds at once. That's the right heart. Amen. When we study the Bible with people, when you're here at church, the right way to respond is with immediacy. It's to respond right away, to do whatever is required of you. If somebody's being preached to with the Bible and they don't respond right away, there's something wrong with their heart. They don't have the same heart as Zacchaeus does. You know, it's so interesting because all the people had come out to see Jesus, so they're cheering kind of like a parade. But then Jesus invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house, so you've now been officially licensed by Jesus to invite yourself over to anybody's house. Amen? amen. Say, I'm hungry. Can I come over? Amen. Especially if you're single. Amen? amen? Anthony Elizabeth wants you to come over. They want to feed you. Amen? amen. Today. So it says, okay, they are, they're there, and they're cheering, and there's Jesus. But then he goes to Zacchaeus' house, and it says in verse 7, all the people saw this and began to mutter. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. You know, it's so interesting because people are so fickle. They're so emotional. In one moment, they're like, yeah. And the next moment, they're like, mm, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I don't like that. You know, that's not cool. Like, he went over to the house of a sinner. Like, he should be with us. And we never, like, we, we mustn't. We mustn't change the way we preach. Change the way we live to appease people. We can't appeal to the world by being sort of worldly, amen? Wow. We've got to offer the world what they don't have themselves, and that's the truth from God's word. People on, turn on a dime. You and I are that way, but we've got to commit to being on, like Zacchaeus. You know, there's repentance here, and there's restitution. He says, hey, here's the deal. I'll give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Numbers 5, the Bible talks about what, what's needed for restitution. It says if you've stolen anything, you've got to give it back plus a fifth, okay? So if you've stolen $100, you, you need to pay back $120. That's if you want to repent. So Zacchaeus says, I'll, I'll go even beyond that. I'll give half of everything to the poor. And then in Exodus 22, it says if you've stolen a cattle or a sheep, you've got to pay back four times that amount. So he understands the scriptures right here. He knows the law. He says, I'm ready and willing not only to repent nominally, but with my actions as well. I want to repent. I want to change. And I know what needs to happen. And don't we kind of like, if you think for a moment, consider what needs to change in your life. Can anybody, can you think of something that you need to stop doing? 
Can you raise your hand if you've got that? Can I get a witness? Like, have you thought of something maybe you need to stop doing in your life? Yeah. Amen. A few of us. Anthony, you're good? You don't need to change anything? Oh, okay. Amen. Amen. Just wanted to make sure. Can you think of something that you need to start doing yeah. for the Lord right there? Can, you, can I get a witness? Amen. <laughs> Say, okay. Say, I got us. What is to repent? Stop doing the thing you need to, you know, stop doing right there. Amen. Amen. But start doing the thing that you need to start doing. I want to call us to repent today, to make restitution, to, to knock it off, stop doing the things that we know are wrong, and to start doing the things that we know God has called all of us to. He pays the price for his repentance. Here's this tax collector who goes and collects debts, but he's got a debt that he owes to Jesus, and Jesus forgives him of that debt. You know, and then he lays it on out. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That was his mission as a disciple. That's our mission as Jesus' church. Yeah. Jesus' body is the church. On, our purpose in life, to seek and save the lost. Yeah. Even if there were but a few of us committed to that, yeah. Jesus would bless our efforts and we'd see miracle on, after miracle. You know, Zacchaeus was a remnant disciple, amen? Yeah. On, you got any remnant disciples in the house? Yeah. I'm a, I'm a remnant disciple. I got baptized in the new movement, but I grew up in the old movement. My wife was baptized in 2001. My parents moved over to L.A. to join the, the sold-out discipling movement in 2007. You know, remnant disciples are special That's disciples right. because they represent oh. something. What they represent is leadership. Yeah. If you get a remnant disciple on over to the movement, they already know what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. They know they've got to give their contribution, amen? Yeah. And not just part of it, all of it. Are you with oh. me? They know they need to share their faith, regardless of whether or not they're super effective. They know, I got to share my faith. I got to be in a fellowship. I got to be in a church that's fired up for the Lord. Amen. And what that does is it, it brings so much faith to the church. If you're a remnant disciple, you almost automatically are designated as a leader. Amen. Amen. I want to call us. I, I believe that God is going to use us to, to bring many people back to faith, to restore those that have gone astray and even have a few place membership. Amen? Amen. Point number two, an ongoing challenge. In verse 11, it says, while they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. <laughs> he, is made, he was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. And this is very interesting. You've got to get a little bit of history from what's going on right here. And also, this is confused oftentimes with the parable of the talents, but it's actually two different parables. Well, first of all, this, this man is, is essentially going off to this distant country to have himself appointed as king. This is the same thing that Herod did, uh, who was essentially the leader when the king of, of Israel, when Jesus was born, right? So this is an evil guy. He's the guy in Matthew 2 that had all the babies uh, put to death because he was fearful that somebody would come and take his throne. His son did the same thing. His name was Archelaus. And he was to go to Rome to be appointed king. And when he arrived, there were already 3,000 Jews there protesting his appointment. He said, he cannot be king. He's an evil man. He's already killed many of the Jews in Israel. So then he's not appointed king, but rather a tetrarch of that area. So when Jesus lays this parable out, they know exactly what Jesus is talking about. At least they have some kind of frame of reference. And it goes on, and it says that he gives this, these minas to these people. In verse 16, it says, The first one came and said, Sir, your minas earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your minas earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here's your mina. I've kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words. You wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to those standing by, take his mine away from him and give it to the one who has ten minus. Sir, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, 
more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. You know, this is a Jesus we don't hear about often on Sunday mornings. He says, hey, hey, wait, take from the one who doesn't have, give more to the one who does have, and then kill those guys in front of me. Wow. I mean, that's a, kind of an intense way to end that parable right there. Well, what's the point? You know, Jesus, when he kind of frames it right here, he's alluding to himself. He says, I'm the king. I'm going to a higher authority to be appointed. He went to heaven, amen? amen. And he'll be on his way back. We don't know when he's coming back. But we do know he's coming back. Amen. He says, whether you like it or not, Jesus is king. You know, there's a phrase that's often thrown around the religious world to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You can accept him if you like. It doesn't matter. He is your Lord, whether you like it or not. And the only way for him to be your Savior is if he's your Lord. Jesus is Lord and Savior. He's king in Christ. He's ruler and rescuer. He's master Messiah. But he must be your Lord to be your savior. Are you with me here? Jesus is king. You know, and a mina is worth uh, about three months, a three months wage. How would you feel if I gave you three months worth of your uh, wage? Would you, would you be pretty fired up about that? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't that be exciting? I'd be pretty fired up myself. I'm like, yes, thank you. Three months. That's awesome. Not a three months advance, just three months in general. And really what it's equivalent to is salvation. And this is freely given. He says, here's, here's salvation. Here's your mina. Go and put it to work. You know, you can't work to be saved. There's no way you could ever merit your salvation. You could never earn it. You'll never be good enough to be saved. It's grace that we're even alive today, amen? The fact that you're here breathing is like God is awesome. Amazing grace. Are you with me? But... Even though you can never work to be saved, you're saved to work. You know, and you'll be rewarded accordingly. Here, the one guy comes, and he's earned ten more. He took that mina, he took that salvation, and he went and he was fruitful with it. And God says, well done, my good and faithful servant. The next guy says, well, I've got five more. You know, that's pretty good. He says, that's awesome. Take charge of five cities. You know, in the kingdom, we believe in earning the right to lead. In Philippians 2, verse 22, it says, But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Paul right here says of Timothy that he's proved himself. He's proved that he's faithful. He's proved that he's diligent. He's proved that he's trustworthy. And we've got to prove ourselves time and time again. It's an ongoing challenge. Amen? Amen. Once proved, not always proved. You know, right now, you're the sum total of every single one of your decisions. If you look at your life and you think your situation, be it challenging or be it inspiring, you are the sum total of your decisions. Of course, there are other factors, but after all, you've responded to those factors. You could have been given a whole lot and have squandered it, or you could have started with nothing and have earned much. You're the sum total. And you say, there will be judgment after you die. Yeah. Wouldn't it be awesome to be judged like halfway through your life? Mm-hmm. Like if, if Melissa was judged right now, it'd be a good time to be judged. Amen. She strung together some good decisions and she said yes to Angel. I mean, that's a, that, that took some faith right there. Amen. Oh, say, so can we get the judgment happening now? He said, well, no, because when you die... You're the sum total of all your decisions. You'll have to make decisions all the way up until the end. You know, this last guy who buried the mina has his mina taken away. And remember, what's the mina? It's salvation. What do we understand from this passage? Once saved, not always saved. If you don't work it, if you don't make it happen, if you don't, out of gratitude, And faith, understanding God's grace, put what God has given you freely to work. Well, then you don't understand God. And this guy really misunderstood God. Are you with me? He says, take what he has and give to the one who has 10. You know, at the end of the day, the Bible calls us to be grateful. The Bible calls us to put this salvation to work. We want to be fruitful in God's church. Amen? Amen. And if you're an orange tree, what do you expect an orange tree to produce oranges. oranges 
How do you feel if you've got an orange tree that you've planted and there's no oranges on it? That doesn't fire you up. That, that's not a good thing, amen? What good is an orange tree that doesn't produce oranges? Not really good at all. There's plenty of trees that don't produce fruit that can provide us with shade. It says we've got to be fruitful as God's amen. people. Point number three, a reckoning will come. You know, we'll be, we'll, there will be a reckoning. There, there, we will have to answer for what we've done in our lives. And you know, it's, it's encouraging to know that at the end of the day, God is going to judge us according to the Bible. Not according to how we feel. Because you could feel really saved one moment and then feel really lost the next moment. You won't be judged according to your traditions or what you grew up believing. After all, 95% of the world in religion is societal and cultural. It's wherever you're from and whatever your parents did. That's typically what you end up doing. Amen? Amen. This is you're not going to be judged by that. You're not going to be judged by what your pastor says. Amen? Before God, he'll use the word to judge you. That's a little scary. The encouraging part is we've got it right here in our hands. We can know exactly what God expects from us and answer the call. Amen? Point number four, killed or commended. You know, he commends the one who had gained ten more and the one who was ungrateful. And the one who then tried to blame it on God is killed. Verse 28, if you pick it up, says, After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. So Jesus says, go to this place and take this colt. You know, like, well, Jesus like, how do we do that? He says, just show up and just take it. It'll be there. So they're untying the colt, and then it's like, hey, what are you doing with that colt? The Lord needs it. All right. You know, they take the colt back. <laughs> And, you know, this is the triumphal entry. You would imagine that if this is King Jesus, he'd come in on a stallion. I mean, like, cranking like a king. But he doesn't. He comes in on a donkey. It's a beast of burden. What's the point? It's not about how you look. It's about how much work you can get done. How much can we saddle you with? How much responsibility can we give to you? After all, if you're faithful with but a few things, you can be faithful with many things. Amen? So the challenges in your life are really a test from the Lord. He's testing you. Are you able to do much? Yeah, you can do a lot. Are you with me? You can reach your full capacity and your full potential. What we're really talking about is a willingness. Are you willing to give up the ghost and pay the price for what the Lord has called us to do? You know, in Zechariah chapter 9, it it prophesies that, that the Messiah would come in on a colt and come in on a donkey. So when he sends his disciples, he knows he's about to fulfill a prophecy. (laughs) I mean, that's a way to live, amen? And it says that when he comes in, in verse 32, those who were sent ahead found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, his owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, "Lord, Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. You know, as Jesus is coming in, it says the whole crowd of disciples joins together in song. And they all raise their voices. With loud voices, they sing to God in unison. You know, you might ask yourself, why do we sing the way that we sing? Because that's how they sang when Jesus came in. They said they raised, you know, it's cool if you add a guitar and all that. Like, that's awesome. Amen? You get a little like a djembe or like like a bongo. That's cool too. Amen? But ultimately, it says, hey, we lift our voices and sing to God. Not just those that are, you know, out of pitch, amen? Because we got some of those too. But, you know, don't worry. If you're totally off pitch, there's somebody on the other side that's totally off pitch in the other direction. You'll balance each other out. It'll be beautiful, amen? This is everybody, the whole crowd of disciples, they lifted their voices and sang. They were so fired up that the Pharisees were compelled to say, calm them down. (laughs) They're too excited. And Jesus is too excited. In verse 40, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. We walk by literally, the, the earth is, is 
jumping to sing out to God. And if we don't, the rocks will. The trees will clap their, you know, we got some California people with us, amen? And uh, we, we went on a date last night, and it was awesome. We went to uh, uh, the Columbia restaurant down there in Ybor City. You ever been there? I was expecting a little bit more of like a, woo, like a whatever. Amen. It was awesome. And, uh, and I'm walking, and a palm frond falls from the tree. And I was with Corey and Vanessa. I said, a palm frond just fell from the tree. They're like, a palm what? I was like, a palm, a, a, a big palm leaf. I don't know what you call the thing right there. It says, that's what they used to uh, prepare Jesus' way. I don't know why I brought that story up. But anyways, the point is, oh, yeah, because the palm fronds will sing. If we don't sing, the trees will sing. Amen? This is, what's, what's the point? We, we come together. There's nothing like it. Before I even became a disciple, I, I came to church, and I wanted to sing. And I think we got some of those. It's like, you're like, this is awesome. Like, I want to, but I was too prideful. I was too cool. Thank God the guy studying the Bible with me looked over at me. He said, Sing. I was like, okay, I'll start singing, you know. He said, don't be too cool to sing to God. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I mean, that's, right. that's, that's not a good place to be. That's right. You know, verse 41, it says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming. You know, right here, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. He weeps over the lostness of people. You know, our desire is to make an impact for God. And the way to do that is to weep when you realize the brokenness of the world that we live in. Even this morning as I was reading through the news, there was a woman who, who was charged uh, because her five-month-old son had suffered life-threatening brain injuries. Because she was in a tirade at, her, at the baby's father, she picked up the boy twice, and his head snapped back, and he had bleeding in his brain. That's the world. That's reality. And it says that Jesus, when he saw Jerusalem, he wept over it because they didn't see it. He presented himself as the solution. He says, you want peace? I'm here. You can have it. But they rejected him because they were too cool to sing. And it broke his heart. He said, if you, if, if you only knew what you're missing out on. You know, as we go out and we share our faith and we invite people to study the Bible, and so many will say no. And, and, and it hurts, but we mustn't have self-pity. We need to be brokenhearted and weep over the lostness and be even more invigorated in our search because the harvest is plentiful. There are, there are literally thousands of people in Tampa that want to seek the Lord. They want to find God. We, we can't be distracted by those that don't want to sing. Amen? Right. We can't be distracted by those that refuse to see. We can't be distracted. We've got to have our own peace. And God wants to use us. Amen? Yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting. Like, we might not, you might not have been like, we're kind of like the second round draft picks. You know what I mean? Like, we didn't go in the first round. We, we might not be the cream of the crop right there. Amen? Like, maybe we went to a Division three school right there. Amen? Say, so, okay, wait, but... God is awesome. You're God's first round draft pick. Amen. You went number one. He traded Jesus for you because he wants to use you. And he wept over the city. Jesus wept over you. You know, the first point is the wondrous gift. The second, the ongoing challenge. The third, a reckoning will come. The fourth, killed or commended. Well, if you take the W from wondrous gift, the O from ongoing challenge, the R from reckoning, and the K from killed or commended, what do you get? Work. work. It's time for us as God's people to put his mina to work, to put his salvation to work because we are grateful for everything that he's done for us. After all, now is the time of God's coming. Amen. I love you very much. And to God be the glory.